the global human rights movement has persuaded many countries to respect fundamental liberties, at least by the letter of the law. But for billions of people around the world, those laws aren't worth very much. This is uh, Sia Kadi. She's from Nimiyama chiefdom in eastern Sierra Leone. And she woke up two years ago to find poles erected on the land she has lived on all her life. Turns out a chief sold 1,400 acres to a Chinese rubber company, and no one bothered to ask the 70 families whose land it was. For Sia and many people like her, land is precious. It's the source of food and income and water, medicine, shelter. It's also where you celebrate, where you pray, where you bury your dead. These families knew that under African customary law, what the chief had done was not possible because under customary law, the land doesn't just belong to the people who are alive now, it belongs to the ancestors who came before and the descendants who are not yet born. The chief does have a role as a steward of the land, but he cannot sell what is not his. In addition to customary law, Sierra Leone has formal statutory laws. Some of them came from the British. Some of them have been adopted by the Sierra Leonean parliament. And these families were told that it was those formal laws and the national quest for development that made what the chief did not just possible, but necessary. Blocked from their land, some of them left to try to find work as laborers in nearby chiefdoms. Some of them tried to stay and fight. I had the privilege of living in Sierra Leone for four years, and I have seen firsthand how law can be spun like this into a cruel mystery, a ruse for oppression. I moved there in uh, 2003, after the end of a brutal 11-year civil war. And at that time, people agreed that exploitation and unfairness were a big part of why that war had happened in the first place. And human rights groups wanted to support people who face injustice in their daily lives. But a conventional legal aid model would have been unworkable. There were 100 lawyers total in the country at the time. And out of that 100, 90 were in the capital, Freetown. So instead, we deployed community paralegals. Sometimes we say barefoot lawyers, who can be a bridge between formal legal promises and real life. Paralegals educate people about laws and policies, and they help people to take action to pursue practical remedies to injustice. That experiment after the war grew into a, a movement, and there are now paralegals serving about 40% of the country. And these families, they found two of them. Their names are Hassan Sisse and Fatmata Kanu. Now, if you, if you bring a problem to a lawyer's office in Freetown, he'll listen to you, um, and then he'll say something like this in Sierra Leonean Creole. He'll say, okay, I don't hear left the money, you go no more, me go handle them for you. Which is, uh, okay, I've heard you, leave some money on the table, you go ahead, I'm gonna handle it for you, I've got you. Not too different from what, they, uh, what you would hear at a law office in Washington, D.C., where I live now. But we are aiming for legal empowerment, and so we've got a different message. Not, I'm gonna handle it for you, but we're gonna handle it together. And in the process, we're both gonna grow. So Hassan and Fatimata, they explained to these families that actually uh, the formal law was on their side. At most, the chief could have leased farmland, but uh, even that would have required the consent of the people who have customary rights to it. So the bill of sale that the chief signed and the eviction by the company, they were completely illegal. With that knowledge, they tried for a solution. They reached out to the chief and the company. They engaged the Ministry of Land and the Ministry of Agriculture. And many times, those basic tools, organizing, 
advocacy with administrative institutions, negotiation, those basic tools many times can do the job. We have seen that well-equipped paralegals and their clients can squeeze justice out of even broken systems. But this was one of those cases where the, the frontline methods did not succeed. The, the chief and the company were intransigent, and the two ministries were unresponsive. So the paralegals and the families, they ended up working with a Sierra Leonean lawyer named Sonkita Conte to bring a case in the high court. And a couple months ago, February of this year, the high court did something unusual. It ordered that all of that land be returned and that reparations be paid for the damage that was done. It's planting season right now, before the, before the rains come, and that's where these families are. They're back on their land, they're planting rice, cassava, cocoa, cashew, and paralegals around the country are educating people about that high court judgment and working to stop land grabs before they happen. Fanta Nianda, she's the one with the the red head wrap, she was active throughout this process. And that day in the courthouse, when the judgment came out, she said to us, we now know the law is for us. That's the transformation we're looking for. Let the law be for all of us. And we, we need that transformation, not just in Sierra Leone, we need it everywhere. I'll give you one more example. This is Manisha Goswami. She's from Gujarat, India, which is the same state where all my own family comes from. She lives in a town called Vapi, which is one of the most polluted places in Asia. Vapi has hundreds of chemical factories producing pesticides and fertilizers, dyes and drugs. And Manisha first became active because her daughter has asthma. And she connected the pollution with her own daughter's struggle to breathe. And she became a kind of vigilante. She made friends with a lot of the night workers at these factories. And if a company sent a tanker to dump illegally in the river, one of the workers would call Manisha. And she would leave her house in the middle of the night, drive out to the riverside, close the tap on the back of the truck, slash the tires, and call the police and a journalist. Um, yeah, she's, she's fierce. Um, but at one point, Manisha got beaten unconscious in the street in the middle of the day. We still don't know who did this. No one ever got arrested, but we believe it was retaliation from someone in industry. Manisha, though, she didn't give up. She became a community paralegal. Um, and she says it changed her life. It gave her a channel for her energy. She's not slashing tires anymore. Manisha is engaging India's complex regulatory system. She helps people from VAPI to understand environmental law, to document evidence on non-compliance, and to advocate for solutions. And this, this new approach of understanding and using the law, it is generating results. Last year, she and a big group of fisher people from VAPI successfully persuaded the state government to take enforcement action against 53 factories that were dumping illegally in the river that runs through VAPI. We work with paralegals like Manisha and Hassan and Fatimata in 10 different countries, and every one of them tracks data on every single case. Things like, what steps did the clients take? What laws did they invoke? How did the firms and institutions respond? And when you put that information together, it gives you a detailed picture of how laws are working in practice, something that often no one else has. So together with our clients, we use that information to advocate for systemic changes, things like better environmental enforcement procedures in India and better stronger legal protections for the land rights of women in Sierra Leone. This is a different way of approaching institutional reform. It's not a consultant who flies into Myanmar with a template from Macedonia that he's gonna cut and paste. And it is not deduction from abstract principles. This is about growing reforms out of the experience of ordinary people trying to make the rules and systems work. We convene the Global Legal Empowerment Network, which is 
over 600 groups from 150 countries. We're learning from each other, working together. We want to see barefoot lawyers working with communities everywhere, from Flint, Michigan, to Kinshasa, to the forest of Borneo. We humans, we're not going to overcome any of the great challenges we face. Protecting the environment, ensuring a fair and flourishing economy, securing basic liberties. We can't achieve any of those things if our laws and systems only work for the most powerful. We need law to be something that every single one of us can understand and use and shape. I, um, I, have, a <laughs> I have a little son now, a two-year-old. His name is Luca. A lot of the times I'm trying to convince him to eat his food rather than wear his food. <laughs> but um, at night, when I put him to bed, I think about the world I want for him, a fairer world. I believe we can build it together. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>